Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 118. Psalm 118. This spring, we've been walking through our series on the Psalms, first looking at the Psalms from the perspective of finding God in the midst of the messiness of life. Life is filled with circumstance, trial, temptation, difficulty comes our way, and God can be found. That is that the Bible teaches us to read the Psalms that way. They are, they are books, they are, uh, sorry, they are poems and they are songs that are written right there in the midst of that trial. Very poetic, meant to draw you in, that says, hold on, God is near, he can be found. But also, the Psalms are a book as a whole, with a narrative and a theme, and there is a movement. And the Psalms, more than any other book in the Old Testament, predict the coming of King Jesus. That God, in poetic fashion, has woven together his story like a symphony about the coming of his son. And church, it's written in such a way, it's like a mystery novel. That as you go through and you pick up bits and pieces, you're kind of perplexed. You're kind of going, oh, I'm, I'm excited. I'm anticipating. Where is this going? And then once the final who did it or unfolding is finally unveiled, if you go back and you read that novel for a second time, you can never see it the same way again. You're like, well, it's plain. It's obvious. It's right there. Oh, this guy did it the whole time. He's just been hiding under that rock. That's the way God predicts the coming of his son through the Psalms. Okay? So this morning, in Psalm 18, what we're going to see... Two weeks ago, we went through Psalm 89, and then last week, we went through Psalm 110. I'm going to rebuild those for you, but Psalm 118 works together as a completion of this movement, and I want you to see it, because Psalm 110 and 118 are the most quoted Old Testament passages. The apostles picked up these passages and showed them to their contemporaries and said, do you see this? It's been predicted for hundreds of years, the waiting, the unfolding, the anticipation of God sending his son. Do you see it? And now you and I can look and we can know that these have long been written down, hundreds of years before the coming of Christ. And we can see, and as it's unfolded, and we can be marveled, absolutely just blown away how God is the author of not only the scripture, but all of history. That he is the sovereign king who writes and who pins and who orchestrates it all. From that perspective, listen to me, church, everything changes. Everything changes. So this is going to be a difficult sermon in the fact that there's going to be a lot coming at you. This is going to be one of those sermons where honestly, beloved, I want you to go home and I want you to watch it during the week and I want you to like take notes. Like he referenced that passage and that passage and that passage. It's going to be one of those where you're not going to have time to mentally process all the passages I'm referring to, but I promise you, I am trying to teach you to piece your Bible together. Haven't you ever read the Old Testament and just scratched your head and go, I don't know what all this is talking about. I'm going to try, I have been trying to piece these and show you how to read the Old Testament and how it predicts the coming of the king. Okay. So it's worth it. Why? Because this is the way that God has revealed himself. And God is a dramatic, magnificent God who unfolds himself, the coming of his son, in dramatic, symphonic form. Now we also get to take the Lord's Supper today. If you did not get elements on your way in, you can raise your hand. Deacons are going to pop up right now, and they're going to help you get these elements. Go ahead, lift your hand. Hey, we did pretty good. All right. The entire service is moving towards the Lord's Supper, and we're going to be doing it slightly different this time. 
That is about halfway through, we're gonna take the bread and then I'm gonna preach for another five, 10 minutes and then we're gonna take the cup. I tell you that, so don't open the cup too early because then you'll just be sitting there with a cup, okay? Now, with that said, let's pray. Let's enter into a time where we wanna hear God's word. Heavenly Father, we come before you. God, your word is magnificent. You have revealed yourself to us. You have predicted the coming of your son. Allow us to see, allow us to taste the magnificence, God, and to apply it to our lives. God, our lives are filled with so many circumstances that are beyond our control. And if we can pause and we can look back and we can see that you are the author of all of history. Certainly you are the author of my life. And you are on your throne. And you predicted the coming of your son and you have told us of his coming again. To which we long and we wait. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, two weeks ago, Psalm 89. The context, very, very important. You see, because Israel has fallen, Judah has fallen to Babylon. Babylon, the superpower of the day, has come in and, and conquered. They have been too strong, too mighty. And the psalmist sits in exile in Babylon. And Jerusalem has been destroyed. The temple, where God's holy presence, God's Shekinah glory dwelt, burned to the ground. And the Davidic line, the promises given to the king of David, David in the Davidic line has been slain. The last king, his eyes poked out after he had seen all of his sons murdered right in front of him. And now the psalmist sits in Psalm 89 and he says, look, God, I've been reading my Bible. You gave promises to David. You said in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that David would have a forever kingdom. That you removed your hand from Saul, but you would not remove your hand from David. That, that his descendants would be as a son to you. You would deal with him personally and intimately as he leads you would be a father to him. And, and, and if we as a people, if we begin to go astray, you would correct us with the hand of discipline, but you promised you would not forsake us. You would not forsake us. And there the psalmist sits in 89 and he just gets real with God and he says, God, I'm looking around and it doesn't seem like any of these promises can be true. Jerusalem's destroyed, the temple burned to the ground, David's line slain. How can these promises be true? And then Psalm 89 ends with two lingering questions. How long, O Lord? How long? And where is your faithfulness? That you swore. That's how book three of Psalm ends Allowing that, that, those questions to just sit on your palate, in your mouth, as you wait. And book four opens and it doesn't give us an immediate answer. Remember, this is a symphony. It doesn't give us an immediate answer, in part because where the psalmist sits, we still have 500 years before the coming of the, of the sun. And so book four, as a whole, as a unit, it basically just says, keep waiting. A thousand years, they're just like a day for God. Can I remind you, God's on his throne, but keep waiting. That's all book four says. But then last week, we looked at book five. It opens up in Psalm 107, and suddenly the music begins to build it reminds you of the promises of David, the promises that God had given 
And then from David's own voice in Psalm 110, the promises and the king come forward as David says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand and I will make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And then in verse four, and he swore that you will be a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And we looked at that in its whole. And out of David's own mouth, there is a coming king who is so great that David calls him Lord. And he will be a priest king, uniting the priesthood and the kingly line together. And from David's perspective, Right, The promises that are given forth, you look and you realize, wait a second, those promises that have been given to David about a forever kingdom, you know what, wait a second, there is coming a forever one, a forever king. And Psalm 110 is this magnificent answer to the question that has been looming in Psalm 89. The unfolding of God's movement of history and his promises with Israel. How is it looking like all these things are falling short and the promises begin to unfold because there's coming a forever one. And you can see it promised a thousand years before Jesus ever came. Compiled together in the Psalms 500 years before Jesus ever came. That The coming, the eternal one is coming. So that's Psalm 110. I needed to recreate that scene in your mind so now you can figure out how Psalm 118 fits in with that. Here's why. Psalm 107 to 118 is a tight unit. It's a unit. That whole unit is talking about everything I've just described. It climaxes... In Psalm 110, with the promise, the king is coming. The eternal king is coming. And then 118 ends that section, that unit. It's the summary psalm. Okay? Does that make sense? It's the summary psalm of this promise that has been unfolded. The question asked all the way back in 89. So there's our context. The psalmist sits in exile. He's in Babylon. Jerusalem destroyed. The temple burned to the ground. The Davidic line slain. But now that the, pro- now that the psalmist has the promise of Psalm 110, now that the promise has come, he's filled with so much hope. He's filled with so much joy. Now, Psalm 118 overflows. So you've got it there in front of you. There's two main movements in the psalm. The first movement, verses 1 through 18. There is a collective celebratory call. Verse two, oh, let Israel say his loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let the house of Aaron say his loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let those who fear the Lord say his loving kindness is everlasting. Basically, the psalmist is saying, hey, now that I have the promise, come. Let everyone gather together. Let us all say together, God's loving kindness is everlasting. And then in verses five through eight, the psalmist uses the first person and tells a drama. And basically it goes like this. He says, I am surrounded by the nations and he's on the very brink of death, right? The the, the cords of death have encompassed him. He is fearful for his very life. Now, remember the psalmist is figurative. For the collective whole, this is poetry. They are in exile. He represents exiled Israel. He also represents that if he dies, so do the promises given to King David and the promises to Aaron's line and the promises for all who fear God. But in this Drama, even though he's surrounded by the nations, even though he's on the brink of death, 
Look at verse 10. All nations surround me, but in the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. And he says that three times. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. And then verses 17 and 18. I will not die, but live and tell of the works of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. You see how he's in exile. The nations have surrounded him. It's fearful. It's scary. He's on the brink of death, but he's heard the promises. And now he can say, I will not die. The Lord has not given me over to death. Okay, so that's the end of that first scene. Now this second scene, and this is what I've been building towards. And this second scene, guys, it's so magnificent I want you to circle it. I want you to burn this image in your mind. This is going to help you piece together your Bible. Because in verses 19 through 29, the psalmist in exile, he has this vision. He dreams of returning back to Jerusalem and back to the temple. He's dreaming of what it will be like. And he sees a parade, a procession back into Jerusalem and back into the temple. Look at verses 19 through 21. Open to me the gates of righteousness and I shall enter through them. I shall give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteousness, the righteous will enter through it and I will give thanks to you for you have answered me and you have become my salvation. Reminiscent of Psalm 24 when David presumably brought the ark back into Jerusalem, Psalm 24, and he says, open up the gates that the king of glory may come in. This is Psalm 24. As David makes Jerusalem the capital, as David makes Mount Zion the resting place of God, well, God will permanently dwell there and remain there. This is the the, the sanctioning of the temple there. And in Psalm 24, David says, open up the gates that the king of glory may come in. Now, the psalmist in exile, dreaming and looking forward of the return back to Jerusalem and back to the temple, he imagines this parade. And open up the gates. And there he is, and he is with his people. He says, come Israel, come Aaron, come all who fear God. Come, come, come. It's this parade, this procession, and he is a part of it. It's told from the first person. And they go and they enter into the temple. It's my temple. You see it? That's the temple. And there is this procession. Open up the gates and they come. And he gets to go all the way to the temple. And all are ushered into the... Why? Because that's where the very presence of God is. You get to go in. Do you see it? That's how this whole section closes. Verse 29. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his loving kindness is everlasting. You got to picture this scene. Exiled, returning back to the land, to Jerusalem, and back to the temple. He dreams of it. He longs for it. That scene. Do you see how this scene, from the psalmist's perspective, it is future? Do you see how this scene is going to become very prophetic? I mean, in your Old Testament, particularly during those 400 years with no prophets, right? They had this scene burned into their mind. This is a section you need to circle in your Bible. Circle that. Look at this scene. It's it's the way this whole unit ends. There's the promise of the eternal king and then this procession back into the temple. Now, Look at verses 22 and 23. In this parade, in this scene, this is the statement. The stone 
which the builders rejected, has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. In this futuristic scene, this parade, this this coming back, open up the gates that we may go in and into the temple. And in the temple, there is this stone representative of a new temple, a new building based off this stone. Now, very important, as you piece together your Old Testament, you need to know there are two primary texts where a new stone has already been promised. Okay, you can write this down. Isaiah 28, 14 through 19. Isaiah 28, 14 through 19. And Zechariah 10, 3 through 5. Don't turn there. I'm moving too fast. <laughs> Zechariah 10, 3 through 5, and Isaiah 28, 14 through 19. A new stone had been promised. Why? Well, because all the old leaders of Jerusalem that continue to rise up, the kings and leaders, they, they all fall short. In fact, They continue to stray. God is angry at them. Their hearts do not fix on God. They are self-righteous and they, they, they turn away from God. And they have actually led to the reason they're in exile to begin with. Right? You understand that? So God has promised way back in Isaiah. Isaiah is before our text. Way back in Isaiah, God has promised, hey, we're gonna need a new stone Because if we go back with the old stone, if we keep doing what we're doing, we will just continue this cycle of turning away from God. So it's already been promised that a new stone is coming. But look at Psalm 118, because in Psalm 118, there's a new component that's added to the vision. The stone which the builders Rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The stone which the builders rejected. So here's the scene. Open up the gates. The the exile, the psalmist in exile, looking forward. Open up the gates that we may go back to Jerusalem, that we may go back to the temple. There in the temple, there is a new stone. But the stone has been rejected by the builders, he destined to be rejected. Guys, this is why in the New Testament, you know, Jesus knew this about himself. It's why in Matthew 21, he tells a parable after he had entered Jerusalem On Palm Sunday, what we're going to be celebrating next week, after he had presented himself to Jerusalem as the king, and he stands and he has all the Jewish leaders around them, and they are interacting, and he is teaching with them, he tells them a parable about a vineyard owner who eventually sends his son, and the workers kill his son. And then, you know what Jesus does? He quotes This passage, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Jesus knew what was coming and he told it to their face. And so does Peter in Acts chapter 4. After Jesus' death and resurrection, John and Peter are arrested. They are brought into the temple courtyard. There sits the Sanhedrin. There sits a whole host of Jewish leaders and authority. Anybody who's anybody is there. And Peter stands up right in that moment and says, the stone which was rejected by you. And he points to them. The stone which was rejected by you has become the chief cornerstone. Psalm 118 predicted it hundreds of years 
Later, Jesus fulfilled it. Jesus saw it. The apostles saw it. Do you see it? This scene, this unfolding, the exiled psalmist returning, looking, dreaming about the future return back to the temple. And in the temple, there is this stone, the rejected cornerstone. Now, let me ask you, why was the cornerstone destined to be rejected? I mean, it's such a glorious scene, this return back to the temple, back into God's presence, back, back, back. Why is that scene as glorious and joyous as it is? Why is, why is he destined to be rejected? By and large, not recognized by Israel, hated by the leaders Why was there not sweeping revival when Jesus appeared all through the towns of Israel? Why was Jesus destined to be rejected? Because doctors heal the sick and the broken. And because Christ came to save sinners, lost, broken people. And our pride stands in the way. The Jewish leader's pride stood in the way. They said, in the, they said in their minds, we're the most religious people to ever walk the planet. Their own self-righteousness stood in the way, and so does ours. You see, it's a very humbling thing to admit that at your best, your very best, you are dreadfully insufficient to stand before a holy God. And that you 100% need a savior. 100% Christ dependence is a very humbling invitation that is stumbled over by most. I want you to prepare the bread. I'm going to give you a little extra time to contemplate this morning. This bread represents his body. His broken body. Because he was rejected. But you have not rejected. You are willing to say. Jesus, I need a savior. He who became my sin and was broken on my behalf. He is my only hope. My only trust. His body broken for you. So I want to give you time to do business with your Lord and Savior. Give you time, believer, to confess to him your absolute dependence upon him. And then we'll take it together.
While they were eating, Jesus took some bread. And after a blessing, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body. So let's rebuild the scene. The psalmist sitting in exile has the dream. He has this prophetic vision. He cannot wait because he now has the promises. There is coming an eternal king, an eternal one. And so he says, open up the gates that we may return back to the temple. And there he sees the cornerstone. And so far we've focused on the fact that that cornerstone is the rejected cornerstone. But church, there's another magnificent thread that weaves through the Bible that this psalm predicts, that is picked up in the New Testament. Okay, Not only that the cornerstone is rejected, but that when they return... And when you go back and when you enter into Jerusalem and when you enter in and the new temple, the new temple's there, it's a, it's a new temple. I mean, you're like, duh, no, 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 listen, it's a new temple built off the new cornerstone, built in a whole new way. You see, when they came back from exile, 500 years before the coming of Christ, they rebuilt the temple, Zerubbabel's temple. You can read about it in Nehemiah and Ezra. But that temple, the Shekinah glory of the Lord, never went back and entered into. And that temple, it had all sorts of problems and it went through ups and downs through history. And Herod came along about 40 BC and began to rebuild Herod the Great. And, and, and there was about a 46 year period of time where there was a rebuilding, a reconstruction, made it bigger and larger and more magnificent, that temple. And that was the temple during Jesus's time. But you know what? In John chapter two, after turning over the tables right there in the temple courtyard and he's surrounded by all the chief priests, by all the, the leaders there in Jerusalem and they say, what are you doing? And he now has their attention. You know what he says? Destroy this temple. And I will rebuild it in three days. Amen. They laughed at him. They said, you're not making a lick of sense. It took 46 years to rebuild this temple. What are you talking about? And the disciples give a little. He's talking about his body. He's not talking about the construction He's not talking about brick and mortar. He's not talking about stones. There is a new temple coming. And it's why in 1 Peter chapter 2 picks up this same passage in Psalm 118 and says, Church, don't you understand? You are the new temple. You are a living temple. You have been built upon the chief cornerstone. It's a new temple. We're living. We need a new temple. We can't go back to the old temple. Don't you understand? It's a psalmist sits in exile and he sees this vision. And he says, open up the gates that I may come in. If we just go back to the way that it was, how do we not end up with the same self-righteous results? But the psalmist sees something that is so magnificent it's the unfolding of the rest of the New Testament. It's the promises that are given to us that you and I are a living, breathing temple, that he has ripped out our heart of stone and inserted a heart of flesh, that the Shekinah glory, the presence of God is no longer in a building in Jerusalem on the other side of the world. Rather, it is in his people and that you and I, we gather together on a Sunday morning Wherever the gospel is preached and wherever his people show up, you and I gather together and we are the living temple 
Don't you see the promises as they begin to unfold? The psalmist looks forward and he doesn't just see the rejected cornerstone. He doesn't just see the old temple rebuilt. He sees something completely magnificent and new. And the Old Testament saints, they longed for our day. They longed for our day. So I want you to prepare the cup. And I'm going to give you longer than normal. Because I, I, we, we jam pack our schedule and it's like, do this, do this, do this, do this. Let's, let's get it all in. But listen to me. Guys, we are the temple. The living temple. Gathered together. Right here. So I want to give you time. And would you just ask God to speak to you? I mean, if you're a born again believer, the Holy Spirit indwells you. This cup is a celebration of victory. That God, from the beginning of time, orchestrated and unfolded these promises for you. Scripture says he knew you from the foundation of the world. And his spirit indwells you. You are the temple. Jesus, would you speak to your people? Would you convict us where we fall short? Jesus, when you convict, you heal. Jesus, would you lift our heads? Would you remind us of the promises that you have for us? For our lives? That you are working all things out for good. According to your purposes. Speak to your people, Jesus. We long for you. You are our hope. You are our trust. You are our cornerstone. built upon you. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Will you pray with me? King Jesus, forgive us. Forgive us when we take lightly the gathering of your church. Forgive us when we take lightly the privilege to come to you in prayer. 
that you allow us to come before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and enter into the throne of God Almighty and lay down our burdens and our petitions. Forgive us, Jesus, for taking that so lightly. We are grateful this day for your promises, for your coming, and that you dwell within our hearts, and that you're coming again. We are grateful. We love you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.